a member of the John F. Kennedy Jr. Uh, Forum Committee here at the Institute of Politics. Before we begin, please take note of the exit doors located on the park side and the JFK Street side. In the event of an emergency, please exit the door closest to you and congregate in the JFK Forum Park. Uh, please also take a moment now to silence your cell phones. You can join the conversation tonight uh, online using the, ha uh, the hashtag on Twitter, JFK Junior Forum Live. Or you can also follow us on Instagram at JFK Junior Forum. Please take your seats now and join me in welcoming uh, tonight's speakers, uh, Senator Gary Hart and Professor Lauren Summers. We were described as tonight's speakers, but tonight's speaker is uh, Senator Gary Hart, and my job is to uh, introduce him and to draw out his wisdom. I have known uh, and in, been inspired uh, by Gary Hart for more than 35 uh, years. He has had a remarkable public uh, career as uh, the campaign manager for Senator George uh, McGovern, as a rather more successful candidate for elective office himself, as the senator from uh, Colorado, and as a Democratic presidential candidate in uh, the 1980s when he ran what I guess one has to say were not the most successful presidential campaigns in history, but I think we're among the most prescient presidential campaigns uh, in uh, history. Before everyone else was concerned about uh, sustainability and the preservation of the global environment, it was a focus for Senator Hart in the Senate and in his presidential uh, campaigns. Before everyone was focused on information technology, issues of uh, innovation, and what they meant for inequality and industrial uh, structure. Uh, that was a focus uh, for uh, Senator Hart. In a reference that I suspect will only have resonance for the older half of the people in this room, Senator Hart was referred to as uh, the original Atari Democrat. Atari was a cutting edge technology company of the 1980s that has come and gone, but it is a good thing to have been in the same way that having been a Google Democrat in the year 2000 uh, would have been a uh, good thing uh, to uh, be. Careful studies have shown that people who almost win Rhodes Scholarships but do not win Rhodes Scholarships are in life ultimately more successful than the people who do win Rhodes Scholarships. <laughs> we cannot know whether the people who make near-miss runs for the president would have been better presidents than the people who actually became uh, president, but I think there is a substantial chance uh, that that is uh, the case. After leaving uh, the quest uh, for public office um, in the late 1980s, Senator Hart did not abandon his uh, commitment to public service. He has been engaged on any number of issues over time. Perhaps uh, among the more notable of uh, the areas of his interest have been a remarkably prescient report on national security written in the year 2000 that anticipated a major terrorist attack on uh, the United States. His service uh, to the Obama State Department on Northern Ireland uh, issues and on a broad international advice to the Secretary of uh, State. And 
decades during his service as an international attorney of involvement uh, without, I hasten to say, co-optation um, with uh, Russia and with the set of issues that Russia poses uh, for the United States. But I thought it was important to have Gary come back to this forum for another visit because it seems to me that at a time when ideas about the future have never been more important as an aspect of politics. There's no prominent political figure who has been associated in recent times more with the idea of running on the basis of a set of well thought out ideas. So Gary, welcome back to Harvard. Thank you very much. <laughs> If nothing else, you have sent a generation here this evening to home to their Googles to find out what Atari meant. <laughs> Gary, it, it uh, did come and go. I have to say thank you to uh, Professor Summers, who ha has been a colleague and friend for many years, and um, who himself has made such a remarkable contribution to this nation and continues to. And uh, I said to Larry on the phone a few days ago that I wasn't quite sure why I was invited here, having been in the public eye some 30 years ago or more. But I am grateful to be back at, for a repeat performance of some kind. I've had the hospitality of the Kennedy Center, Kennedy School, for three or four times before. But at this stage in life, it's great to be back. And so I'm grateful for the invitation. And thanks to all of you for being here. There are a number of um, very old friends in, in the audience, and I appreciate that very much as well. Let me start with, uh, with this, Gary. Um, if what should I think you and I probably share a common set of concerns um, about what's happened to uh, the international order in the last several years, what's happened to domestic uh, tranquility in the last uh, several uh, years, what's happened to the nature of uh, debate, discussion, and dialogue in uh, the last uh, several years. What should a candidate for president most productively, in your view, be focusing on? You can't talk about everything. You can't. I was um, going to say, how much time? Do we have? Can't talk about you, you know. You, a presidential candidate can't talk about everything. Indeed, there's probably more pressure to reduce things to sound bites than there used to be, and it's complicated when deep and reflective thought confronts slogans. But I suspect a number of you, a number of them, have asked you. They've certainly asked you. They certainly would have if they were smart. What would you tell somebody? who was running for president about how to approach the world today. Again, how much time do we have? Well, I think um, there may be a few people here who would agree with the idea that um, considerable damage is being done to our political system currently, uh, quite possibly our economic system as well, certainly our environmental and uh, resource systems, but also to our international alliances that as have been, has been commented on over and over and over again, that has brought a degree of stability and security to at least the Western democracies, if not the entire world, since the end of World War II. Now, it may be that some members of the so-called base believe it was high time that all these ties be severed and that we move on to something new. 
if we knew what the new thing was, it would be um, a little more interesting to discuss. But other than just destroy those alliances of economics and trade, as well as security and increasingly environmental concerns, with nothing to replace them with, is very problematic. Now, as depressing as some of us find our current political situation to be, and I do find it depressing, the only solace is not a very good one. And that is whatever we're experiencing here that might be called national, nationalistic populism or <laughs> whatever, however you describe it, is being felt throughout the Western democratic world. Now that's small comfort, I think, to say, well, from Sweden to, to Spain and Italy, um, they're experiencing the same things we are. Uh, doesn't make many of us feel much better. But I do think now is the time for really thoughtful people. And I don't, don't mean just presidential candidates, but people on this uh, great, at this great university and others, uh, former office holders, which by the way, parenthetically, I've always had a complaint that those of us who served in office, appointed or elected, end our terms and go away and, no, and the phone never rings. That's a separate issue. I hope some people are calling Larry Summers to ask his thoughts, people in positions of authority. I know my, my phone is not ring. In any case, There is to be designed a new world order. And the pieces are there. And I think we could profitably spend some of the time this evening dis discussing what those pieces are. Things do change. When I was a national candidate, if, if there was a, a central organizing principle and all the things I was trying to get the nation's attention toward, the whole idea of, um, of globalization, the rise of the information revolution, and the implications both those revolutions would have in the future. We have yet to, I think we're still feeling very much the impact, positive but also negative, of globalization, the destruction, not destruction, but the disintegration of national boundaries all we have to do is look at the mess in Great Britain now to see that as an implication of globalization and the pushback that was inevitably going to come to those borders coming down, mass migrations south to north, and the implications culturally of all of that. So the short answer, I think, to the question is, if, if one of these many candidates can put together a kind of coherent narrative about how to use all of these small and large revolutions in a positive way, not only here but in other democracies, uh, there'll be more Nobel Prizes for that person um, with or without the presidency. That's what's really needed right now. We all know there's turmoil. We all know there's uh, a strange brand of leadership in Washington. But no one there or anywhere else that I know of has really begun to put the pieces together in ways that we can think about the next 20, 30, 40, or 50 years. Take, um, say a little bit more about um, the globalization uh, question. Um, the sad truth is that our political party, uh, the Democrats, has basically been unable to find a majority within itself for trade agreements for several decades now. What's changed, importantly, in American politics is 
that now Republicans, Democrats haven't become lots less enthusiastic about trade. It's just that Republicans are now even less enthusiastic about trade than Democrats uh, are. How would you talk to people about uh, globalization in a way that would have a prospect, that you think would have a way of prospect of convincing them that it wasn't all just a threat to them? They're, they're already aware of that, Larry. In a state like Colorado, five, six million people, I started in 88 on behalf of one of the Bell telephone companies, working with the then Soviet government under Mikhail Gorbachev to revolution the Russian telephone system, or the, the Soviet telephone system. And even during, and that's our 88, even during the period of the collapse of the Soviet Union, that revolution continued. Now the amazing thing was, given the history of the Cold War, that the president of the Soviet Union, when he wanted a modern communication system, turned to an American telephone company. So there is recognition everywhere of, of, at least for the time being, superiority in technology here, certainly in communications technology. But, but it, that's not all of it. Colorado farmers make at least as much money shipping grain and cattle outside this country than they, than they do inside. They're all convinced in world, of world trade. I mean, you have to go commodity by commodity, but there is a base out there for, for open, fair, tr free trade in the agricultural community, which has gone almost totally red in this country. And the list goes on. I, I, we have an international trade center in Denver that keeps track of all the companies doing business abroad, and not just handful of companies, but small and medium-sized companies. They're all doing business abroad. So there is throughout the American economy a base for trade. And I think farmers today, are, <laughs> I know they are, feeling the effects of the, of the Trump trade policies, and they aren't good effects. So it's a, you, that message has to be concentrated and borne throughout the country. We benefit more economically. All of us in America, almost all of us, benefit more from trade than we are hurt by it. I'll give you a personal illustration. In the 84 Democratic nomination race, when it got down, well, to three of us, but former Vice President Mondale and the Reverend Jesse Jackson and myself. The contest between me and Walter Mondale was on the issue of trade. At that time, the FLCIO, and I had a very, very strong labor voting record in a non-labor state, had a bill, a protectionist bill called domestic content. Cars in our driveways coming from Japan and Germany and a lot of other places, television sets made somewhere else, textiles, clothing made in, the, in Asia, all hurting American industry, traditional 19th and 20th century industry, manufacturing. But in the, in the primaries and caucuses throughout the country, those states that were benefiting from trade, I won, including almost all the western states and much of New England, and all of those states being hurt by international trade, automobiles, steel, and all the rest, supported Vice President Mondale. And I don't think anybody in the press ever got that division. But it was at, that was a, a watershed time for the Democratic Party. So whether we were a party of trade or protection. Let me ask you a question about um, technology and, uh, and 
globalization or China, really. Um, I just came back from a big economic conference in China. Two things struck me about the experience. One was that at this conference, if you walked down the corridors of the hotel, as you walked every 50 yards or so, you would pass something that sort of looked a little bit like some kind of sensor. And when you walked past, on the side of the wall would come your name and a picture of you because it recognized you and projected your thing up. So the conference didn't need to have any IDs or anything because everybody could be recognized and they knew who it was. The other is uh, that the people on the street, of whom there weren't many, who were begging for money, basically were holding up their phones because their idea was that you'd kind of tap your phone next to their phone and something or other would happen on WeChat and money would get transferred uh, from you to them. So like currency wasn't kind of necessary to doing begging uh, in, uh, in China. This is kind of serious stuff. Um, I mean, these are, these things will come here, I'm sure. I mean, I, I suspect, I suspect we'll be a little more careful around the privacy aspects of facial recognition than is the natural instinct in, uh, uh, in China. But how should we, how much do you think we should worry about all this? And if we're lagging a bit in innovation, what should we do? Well, you're gonna to have to spell out what all of this is. is it, are you focusing on the privacy issue? in the plethora of um, new communication systems? No, I'm less focused, I mean, that, that's, I'd be interested in your views on that, but no, I'm more focused on the, gosh, there's this country that has 1.4 billion people, yeah. and that overall it's only got 20% of our standard of living, but in a bunch of cutting edge technologies, it might actually be ahead of us. Yeah. And, how much should we be scared by the idea of, I mean, you mentioned our kind of technological leadership and the AT&T and Russia needing our yeah, phone system. Well, you know, Russia needs our phone system, but you know, what we're reading in the paper is that it's all very well to be against Huawei, but actually in lots of places in the world, if you want to do 5G, Huawei is what there is. And so I'm just sort of interested if you have any thoughts about how to think about technology when you're not obviously the, when you're not obviously the leader it's so tricky because um, of the national security questions I don't know we have we haven't in this country figured out given the Cold War and and the overlay of the Cold War on sharing information and technology, even with our allies. As you know, in NATO, there were always these questions about, <laughs> in the old days, uh, the Italian Communist Party. If we, if we give them F-4 aircraft, uh, will the Italian Communist uh, send it off to Moscow? I don't know. It was, it's so dated now, it almost doesn't matter. I have, when you talked about the question, I'm, I was brought a couple of years ago to, to think about a series of discussions like this that I had at um, um, the University of Chicago, former uh, chief of staff to President Obama, Axelrod, um, David, Axelrod. David Axelrod, has set up an, uh, a, policy, a political center there. And he brings people, old timers like me, in to talk. And I was there four times, I think, on succeeding Tuesdays or something like that. And in every group meeting, every seminar, there was this very tall, six feet tall Chinese student and spoke perfect English. And every time I had office hours, she would always sign up for the office hours. So finally I said to her, what are you studying? She said, nuclear physics. <laughs> and I don't think 
there was one American student there studying physics of any kind that wanted to hear talk politics. So I, I don't know what that illustrates, except this is a culture that is desperate to learn and catch up. There's no way in the world we can stop that or you should even think about it, but we should be cognizant of it. The other experience I had even earlier than that was uh, the National Institute of, uh, National Science Foundation or National Science, one of the task forces there, about 20 of us were on our task force about sharing about how universities go back, go about protecting, in effect, national, what well, some would consider national secrets. If Chinese students want to come here, or any other students, and learn from the best physicists or mathematicians or whatever, what do we do about that? Now, I guess the president said the other day, uh, keep all the Chinese students out. I, I, don't, I don't know whether he said that specifically, but that was what kind of came across. We've got to protect our secrets. Well, that's, that's folly. It, as it was in the old days, when we were protecting in the Cold War, our military secrets, only to see them in the weekly publication of Air Force News. So, there are no, there really are no secrets. But again, the, after the ramble, the short answer is the race for technological superiority is, is on and it's gonna continue and it's gonna speed up. And uh, all we can do is try to compete. Here's a different kind of, here's a different kind of question that among those who are around now, you're very well, you're very well equipped uh, to answer. Um, there was a previous moment when there was a not very popular Republican president. That Republican president stood credibly accused of a variety of kinds of mismal and non-feasance. The Democratic Party had lost a very close presidential election, previous election, with a candidate from its establishment. There was a very strong sense that um, the party needed to turn in a big new direction, that it needed to become far more progressive, that it needed to dismiss established political leaders and follow the passions of young people, that it needed to focus on turning out people who felt intensely rather than uh, reaching to the middle, that uh, inequality and economic power were big issues, and so very large redistributive programs were, uh, were in order, and that uh, there needed to be a deep sense of America's flaws and embrace of the virtues of many other parts of the world. I'm describing the, what I think is, were the prevailing attitudes in the fall, in the spring of 1971, when Richard Nixon was uh, president and when the Democratic Party was gearing up to nominate uh, the candidate of the new politics whose campaign you managed, um, George McGovern. Um, that was not a resounding political success for the Democratic Party. I only and, managed the nomination part of it. Fair enough. <laughs> uh, that's my story and I'm sticking with it. And, argu and arguably it was, it was not a great success for uh, the country given how the second Nixon term ensued. To what extent do you think that um, experiences is or isn't uh, cautionary and relevant uh, at a moment when people running for the Democratic Party's nomination are proclaiming themselves to be democratic socialists, uh, advocating rather dramatic 
health care, tax redistribution, reparations uh, programs, or do you think that's all 50 years ago and, and the analogy doesn't work? I'd be interested in your reflections on that analogy. I would be interested in your uh, response to my rather primitive thought that re redistribution programs generally in American history have only worked in bad economic times. That if the economy is fair to good, a program of s substantial redistribution is probably not going to work. And I think I told you on the phone an anecdote that sticks in my mind even 30 years later, where polls in New York City showed that taxi drivers were voting for Richard Nixon. And when asked why, they overwhelmingly said, well, I'm going to be a millionaire someday, and I don't want lefty Democrats taking my wealth away. So I think it's, I'm, I'm old enough to be, to remember a little bit of the end of the depression. And it wasn't fun. And people were in terrible, terrible shape. And that's when Franklin Roosevelt could do what he did or begin to do what he did, what he tried to do. But in the McGovern instance, Larry, it wasn't just the haphazard economics, which of course I had nothing to do with. <laughs> That's a joke. It was revolutions on top of each other. Vietnam, civil rights, the emergence of women's rights, the emergence of the environmental movement, uh, the so-called 60s. We, we came in just on that crest of multiple revolutions, more of them social than economic. And much of that has turned out to benefit this country, certainly civil rights. Had it not been for unfortunate circumstances having to do with the running mate in 72, uh, we'll never know whether George McGovern er ever had a chance. The history, as you know, is that incumbents have a 10 or 20 point advantage and they have to really stumble badly or the economy has to be in bad shape or war on the horizon or something to defeat an incumbent. So the odds were against, against us anyway and when you lose in the first three weeks of the general election campaign your running mate, then there was no chance. But my recollection, and correct me if I'm wrong, is that the economy of the nation in the early 70s was reasonably good, and then in 73, 74, went into the ditch. So George McGovern was talking about giving everybody $1,000 as a pump priming measure, redistribution measure. It never resonated outside traditional democratic Circles. The other factor is that I, f I figured out, the first book I wrote was after that campaign, and I had an 11-page appendix to it or, or uh, ending to it, which still I read the other day, still surprisingly good, if I may say so. And the thesis was, after the campaign was over, the, the New Deal engine was running out of steam. That's what a 33-year-old, 32-year-old uh, lawyer from Denver concluded out, out of that experience, that we run on New Deal energy about as long as we could. Now, it took another decade or two for us to figure that, that out, including in 84, but that's what was happening. And nobody came forward with any kind of replacement, comprehensive replacement. Now, today we could talk about the Green New Deal. That's about as comprehensive as you get. But it's more aspirational than anything else. What people should be getting their questions ready. I'm going to ask my last question, 
and then we'll uh, we'll go to the uh, we'll go to the audience. Um, I give these long answers to hold down the number of questions. <laughs> I'm just kidding. You were early on terror, as threats. You were early on cyber, and you were early on the global climate. So what's the national security threat that people should be more worried about now than they are? Climate. It's a global threat. It's serious. It's serious. I, I don't, I mean, this is preaching to the choir. There's nobody here that, if, if anybody here is a denier of the climate change, I'd be amazed, but so what? But it's, um, we're pulling an anchor, folks. A third of this country understands. It's certainly in conclaves like this, where it's uh, understood. I think pretty advanced progressive states like, or purple states like Colorado, uh, people understand most. The mystical base out there doesn't, or if it does, it doesn't want to understand. I don't know, you know, when you boil politics down in a democracy, it really gets to the issue of how do you convince people to do what they ought to do in their own self-interest? Harry Truman said that was, the, that was the hardest part of his job as president, is trying to get people to do what they ought to do on their own. And I, we're up against it now. But, you know, I'd put, I'd put nuclear weapons as a close second. But I just finished, if, if you really want to sober yourself up, read a book that I'm told just won the Pulitzer Prize for fiction, for literature, The Overstory by Richard Powers. Powerful, powerful, powerful. It's about trees. The biggest thing on this planet that absorbs carbon are trees, and we're chopping them down faster than they can grow. So it's willful destruction. We're involved as a species, as a, the human, humanity, in probably the worst act of self-destruction in global history. On that sobering note, um, the floor is open for questions. And the questions are questions here. They end with a question mark. And why don't you please introduce yourself first? Yes, and, and give the, uh, I, told our, I told the moderator that I'm, all of you here are younger than I am, but if, I hope you live as long as I have. And I can guarantee you, if you do, you're going to lose some of your hearing. So fire away. Um, just a point, uh, Senator. OK, on. you've already lost me. <laughs> just a, a point on the last remark you made about the trees. Uh, uh, Ronald Reagan had said that uh, trees cause acid rain, probably in the same breath that he also said that government was the enemy, and the people that he brought into government or that came into, in with him on the heels of Richard Nixon, whom you've described with the good professor, uh, your efforts to change the whole climate, change the perspective. The media did not come along for the ride. They were invested. Question? They were interested in playing the game. Is it true that you won 25 states in your first uh, presidential run? Him. He asked whether you won 25 states in your first presidential run. I think so, but it was. But the media years says ago. the media says you won New Hampshire and then you never won another. Could state. we have a, could, could 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 we have just one question? Yes, sir. Matters of principle. That's a, a blog that you have for people to be able to reach you, to be able to communicate with you, and uh, you said your phone didn't ring. 
but in fact, uh, two presidents, one in 1990s and the other in the 2000s, contacted you, according to James Fallows, to give advice on reform of the military. Is that not true? He asked whether, he, he asked whether you were involved in giving advice to presidents on military reform in the, in the 1990s and subsequently. I to, think the to, two yes. presidents, to two presidents. Yeah, Thank we you. Started, we started, um, a number of us started in the 70s to try to redirect the thinking in the Congress, at least, if not in the country, on, on defense and security in the middle of the Cold War, away from numbers, amount of money, which the whole debate was about then. How much should we spend? Conservatives wanted to spend more, liberals wanted to spend less, and then we've got into weapon systems and all that stuff, all the wrong questions to ask. I won't go into the theory of military reform, but the answer to the question is yes. And we had an impact because there were a number of young officers coming back from Vietnam who understood that the top people, civilian and military, uh, didn't understand the, the trends in warfare. They were still fighting World War II in, in the jungle. And, uh, that didn't turn out too well. And finally, I thank want you. to I, I, thank, I want you, to thank you. Thank you. Thank you, sir. I just yes. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, uh, my name is Ben Bolger. I'm a Harvard alum. And uh, a number of years ago, I was a student at Oxford and uh, studied there for three years. And I was fortunate to bump into you while I was a student. And I discovered joyfully that you were a student uh, returning to work in your DPhil. And I'm just wondering if you could share with us, uh, after you had an illustrious career, uh, what made you decide to return to academia to get your DPhil? I was so struck by your intellectual uh, curiosity uh, after your career. So I'm just wondering if you could just tell us how that decision happened and what was it like to be at Oxford? Well, I started out to be, a, thank you for the question, I started out to be an academic. I, was, I had in mind when I went to graduate school, and, another university down the road uh, to study philosophy and religion and teach at the college level. And a whole bunch of factors came together to interrupt that degree program. And I switched to the law school and the rest is history. But then in my early 60s, the fact that I hadn't finished that degree still kind of haunted me. And I had been invited to do a visiting fellowship at one of the colleges at Oxford and fell in love with the place. And um, took a wild roll of the dice, which I've done a couple of times before, and um, applied for a DFO program and was accepted. And um, obtained the degree in the spring of 2001 in political theory. The thesis was Jefferson's ideal of the republic as it might apply to 21st century America. So it was both political history, the theory of the Republic, as applied to modern day circumstances. And one of the pieces of that, of that thesis had to do with how local communities, local republics, could be involved. And I was at the same time co-chair of the US Commission on National Security for the 21st Century, which had already predicted terrorist attacks on America. So I put that in my thesis, that local communities, what, who were the first troops we called out after 9-11? The National Guard in every state in the Union, at airports. Those are local citizen soldiers. So that, I, my thesis advisor later, several years later said he had the, honor of, of supervising a thesis in which the candidate for the degree forecast terrorist attacks on America. And, and that thesis is in the Bodleian Library, I think. Anyway, um, I thought that continuing education was going to take over. People were retiring earlier, many of whom had wanted to get advanced degrees or finished college degrees. So I thought I was on the cutting edge of something. I don't think I really was. I don't know how many people have gone back and done that. 
But I did consult the Senate historian who said he could not find a record of any senator who had earned a PhD after leaving the Senate, and he could not find a record of any senator who had a DFO from Oxford. So that's my claim to fame. <laughs> uh, Jonathan Kepner, Advanced Leadership Fellow. A question for both of you, following up on President Summers' question. If the Democrats were to nominate a progressive like Elizabeth Warren or Bernie Sanders, do you think it's uh, possible, if not likely, that it might be a replay of the McGovern scenario in 72? Well, in a sense, you just posed the question that uh, I was uh, posing to uh, Senator Hart in a slightly more indirect way. And Senator Hart gave um, what I judge to have been an elegant answer to the effect that uh, there were many reasons why Senator McGovern was defeated as badly as he was, none of which had anything to do with the quality of the campaign management. <laughs> and, um, Thank you. But they did have to do with a number of aspects which were not, uh, uh, not economic and which had to do with the fundamentals of running against an incumbent president but I judge that Senator Hart, who was infinitely closer to it all than a freshman at MIT like me was, um, also uh, said that he did not think the sense of redistributive economics had resonated with uh, cab drivers, which I took to be a proxy for some substantial swath of uh, the, uh, the electorate. So I think I heard Senator Hart say that you wouldn't want to find, when you lose 49 states and you lose by 20% of the vote, there's probably more than one cause for your loss. Um, there probably a lot of causes for your loss, but that the economics, but that the radical aspects of the economics were certainly not helpful and I would be surprised if the more radical aspects of some of the economics that's being proposed would be helpful in the context of a general election uh, campaign right now. And if you heard that answer as rounded and multisyllabic and not completely direct, that was wholly intentional. I, I concur. I think if you can what, what's unemployment, three and a half? 3.8. How many quarters, or how many years has this, this economy been going? People don't, everyday Americans don't think they're in too bad shape. They're scared for a whole lot of reasons, and they ought to be, but I don't think they're feeling desperate. Now, are there too many homeless people? You bet, way too many. Um, Hungry people, yes, but if but you're gonna only way you're gonna house them and feed them is to tax people, and I'm all for a um, higher tax on upper income people. But you start that program, and what what everyday Americans hear is they're gonna take my money away from me, those Democrats. Now, I think, Senator, to her credit, Senator Warren is working on some ideas on taxation and redistribution that are, if not intricate, at least interesting and novel. And I would encourage that so long as she and those around her avoid the dreaded S word, socialism, which the man in the White House is gonna hang all over them, every, every tweet he does, and, and, and find a way to communicate with those everyday Americans as to why this is in their interest to do. My name is Barcy Murningham, and I was the Belknap County press coordinator for George McGovern back in 1971 <laughs> in New Hampshire. You were a child. 
Well, I'd moved out here from Michigan, where I come from generations of Republican public servants, and that was a party of uh, fighting slavery and oligarchs. My question is, and I actually happen to hold Pat Moynihan's book of edited articles on urban policy. Many of my mentors, now deceased, are in here, but he argued for a basic income uh, subsidy. So these ideas you know, were very prevalent back in 1970. My question, and I've been around Harvard for 40 years in degree capacities, teaching capacities, research capacities. Here's my question for both of you. How might we reconsider how we define capitalism so that it is rooted in civic virtue rather than strictly financial metrics that don't reflect the real economy? Well, I, I became entranced 25 years ago by the concept of the republic. We call ours, if you, if you walk outside this hall, stop 10 people, ask them what kind of government we have, nine or 10 will say a democracy, which is true. Why then do we salute the flag of a republic? And what is a republic? Okay, this takes you back at least initially to Athens, 2,500 or more years, 2,800 years ago, but certainly to the Roman Republic before the empire. Then to, the, to Venice, then to the Swiss cantons, and then oddly enough, Machiavelli resurrected the ideal of the Republic in Florence. That made its way into the English and Scottish Enlightenment and made its way to the United States. The language of the founders was almost all the language of the republic. What is a republic? Popular sovereignty, in the words, the famous words of the Black Panthers, power to the people. There no king, no sovereign, the people are sovereign. Civic virtue, what today we would call citizen participation. A republic, every one of them said, a republic cannot last and hasn't lasted unless people participate in self-government. Now, why I got enamored of jo Jefferson's local republics, elementary republics, was we've got a republic of 330 million people. So people say, well, I can't participate in government. No, you can, and you have to walk, walk them through what that means. <laughs> I think it was Oscar Wilde was asked what he thought of socialism. And he said, too many evenings. <laughs> Which I think summarizes the problem of the republic. Too many evenings. You've got to go to parent-teachers associations, civic virtue. Then, of course, um, resistance to corruption, which the founders didn't define as bribery, but putting special interests above the common good and the commonwealth. And by that definition, we are citizens of a massively corrupt republic. When I was in the Senate, I, w I am told there were 100 and roughly 150 registered lobbyists. Two years ago, there were 13,000. And that didn't include Paul Manafort, <laughs> among many others. That's, that's all you need to know about corruption in America. I am not sure I can match uh, or add anything. Uh, to, uh, to that answer, I would make um, two, and I can't say anything intelligent about the philosophy, political philosophy aspects, which I think are probably the most important uh, aspects of the question. So I'd say two much more prosaic uh, things. One, where we have conventional capitalism, of the kind we teach in the introductory economics class, actually works pretty well. If you ask uh, 
how many car, how, what fraction of a car can you buy with an hour of wages? Or what fraction of a shirt? Or what fraction of meals at a restaurant? Or, or what fraction of a TV set? There has been vast progress in the last 40 years, depending on just which product it is. You can buy three times as much, five times as much as you could. If you ask why does everybody say wages are stagnant, it's because of the areas that are much more complex. Education, healthcare, uh, housing, where the conventional capitalist concepts um, don't work um, nearly as well. And so the challenge, I think, is increasingly to find ways of making those work uh, effectively rather than to transform uh, the areas where capitalism is actually doing a pretty good job, but because it's doing so good a job, is providing jobs to fewer and fewer people, just as over some long interval, farming basically was a big success, but therefore was providing jobs uh, to fewer and fewer people. So I put a somewhat different perspective on uh, the on the move um, away uh, from uh, capitalism. I guess I would say one other thing. Um, that I think is important for us here to recognize. I think if you ask people out there, how do you feel about, two questions, how do you feel about rich people? And they've got a lot of concerns about ill-gotten gains and inequality and all that. And how do you feel about experts? they're not really much keener on experts than they are on rich people. And so I think we at places like this need to be a little cautious when we devise new schemes to redistribute and treat ourselves as the tribunes um, of uh, people's concerns. We are reaching um, the closing hour, so I'm gonna ask you a final question, Gary. Um, there are uh, quite a number of students here, and there are quite a number of people who are teachers and who are involved in uh, guiding students. Um, from all your experience, as you look forward to the next uh, 25 years, what advice would you give young people starting out today, or to those of us who think of ourselves as being on the front lines of giving advice uh, to young people about what we should tell young people? Well, let me tie the answer to the last question, and I'll do it with a commercial. Friends and longtime supporters of mine are creating something called the Hart Center for Public Service at Metropolitan State University in Denver that will um, be inaugurated this fall. A lot of my former colleagues have created policy institutes at various state universities here and there. This is, this is public service. Um, a lot of leading Americans have, have volunteered for the advisory board. We're gonna have to raise some money, which I hate, but it is back to the question of civic virtue. And I would say to the next generation, find some way, I, I started to say to give back to this country because where are we now? That famous inaugural statement by John Kennedy changed the lives of many of my generation, certainly mine, opened up not only the duties of citizenship. By the way, democracies are about rights. Republics are about duties. And we have a duty to make this country better. Now, that doesn't mean you have to 
go on some missionary venture, although there are people in this audience that I've known for a long, long time. Alan Casey, Eric Schwartz, and a number of others like them who've given their, their lives to social entrepreneurship in the field of education, reading, hunger, nutrition, on and on and on. I could, I could sit here for half an hour, tell you stories of people who ha have changed. In the case of Billy Shore and Share Our Strength, he has fed millions of poor children. Millions, starting from nothing. And so that's, not every one of you will do that, but find time in your life whatever your vocation or profession is, to think about society and how to make it better, perhaps on the national level, perhaps on the community level. Because if this country is going to make it, that it will be because of that. Thank you very much, Senator Gary Hart. Thank you.